tell everybody, Jaguar is a company that has produced some wonderful cars in its time. However, it's also a company that seems to nearly constantly be suffering some form of identity crisis. And while its most recent may well prove to be its last, one of its others is also responsible for one of its greatest moments. This, the Jaguar XKRS. Way back when, Jaguar was a company that seemed to know what it wanted to be. It wanted to make large, upmarket cars that emphasised the qualities of grace, space and pace. And it was very good at doing that. Unfortunately, like many a British company, it was never very good at making money. As time progressed and the mood of the buying public changed dramatically, Jaguar spectacularly failed to keep up with the times. Where other companies had moved on to and were making huge sums from the likes of hot hatches, Jaguar's idea of a car for the people was a big executive saloon with a slightly smaller V8. Even at the turn of the millennium, Jaguar were really struggling to grasp the concept of a car that everybody could buy, not just the management. When the X-Type was released, it featured a 3-litre V6 petrol and all-wheel drive, precisely the opposite of what many people were then buying. Around that time, the Jaguar lineup was also becoming increasingly outdated. The XK was very pretty, but underneath was a 30-year-old XJS. The S-Type, introduced at the end of the 1990s, had done quite well and introduced a number of new buyers to the brand. It's a car I actually rather like. But you couldn't deny that Jaguar's two flagship cars, the XK and the XJ Saloon, were both way past their sell-by. So, a program began to rejuvenate them both. The first to receive the treatment was the XJ, which got a new all-aluminium platform and was a brilliant car. This was followed then in around 2006 with the introduction of the then all new X150 XK. Like the XJ, it now featured an all aluminium platform, making it lighter, stronger and stiffer than the outgoing car. The XK is a car of which I am very fond, but having driven a few, I can see why it failed to shake off the sort of pipe and slippers image that Jaguar felt they were lumbered with and was holding them back. The really weird thing is that though yes, Jaguar has always had this image of being an old man's car, there's also been another side to the brand, the association with the underworld. The Jaguar was often cited as the getaway transport of choice for London's ne'er-do-wells. In a stroke of genius, somebody decided to try and capitalise upon this side of the business. So you had that fabulous marketing campaign which told you that bad guys drive a Jag, and many of the models they introduced became increasingly louder, lower, stiffer, shoutier, and Jaguars were seen sliding up the hill at Goodwood rather than proceeding briskly. That ad campaign debuted in 2014, but the years leading up to it had seen an aggressive shift in Jaguar's direction. The then new XJ received an XJR variant which had been missing since the introduction of the new model. The XFR was joined by the even angrier and louder XFRS, a saloon car with a big wing and an attitude that would grab the attention of even a Holden fan. However, it was 2011's XKRS that's the car I remember most fondly. The funny thing is that you may remember there was actually another car that sat above this and was even wilder, louder and faster again, the XKRS GT. A truly wild thing that had a massive wing on the back and underneath featured a number of components that were actually to go into the forthcoming F-Type. Those are extremely rare, very hard to get a hold of and I have been offered one but it's a very long way away. So if you happen to own one and you live in Great Britain, do drop me a line and maybe, if possible, I'll have a go of that one first. So, putting that car to one side, what makes up the XKRS? Well, this is essentially the production version of the limited run XKR75 that I drove only a week ago. So that car's fairly fresh in memory and will provide an important point of reference for today. Underneath you'll find many of the same components, a lower, stiffer suspension with different and more aggressive geometry to make the car a little bit more focused. Up front, you've got the 5 litre supercharged V8 producing here 550 PS or 542 brake horsepower and at the time that was significant because it made it the most powerful Jag since the XJ220 and it really does go 
sounds incredible too. I believe the changes are similar to those in the XKR75, which had a center section deleted rather than any work being done to the back box. They might have also done stuff there as well, but by ditching the center silencer, you unlock more of that rasp, that hard-edged sound, which is near impossible to get out of a car today. Changes were also made to the six-speed ZF gearbox, and I have to say, they really work. This is actually a fun box to use now. Oh, it whips around that rev counter pretty quickly too. This thing has some serious pace. Top speed was limited to 186, but without much effort, if it was delimited, it would have gone well past that. The most radical changes really were twofold. First, the looks of the car, and that's an area that I'm still divided on because in some ways I think it's absolutely sensational, aggressive, loud, bold and brash in a way that Jags traditionally aren't. However, the front end in particular I feel may have gone a little bit too far. The XKR75 was a more subtly styled car, still had more traditional Jag about it. Hop into the comment section down below now and tell me which side of the fence you're on. Is this a looker or not? It was also more expensive than any other XK before, with a price now perilously close to £100,000. The GT eventually smashed through that, being I think around 135, but as that was a very limited run car, that doesn't count. These are already a fairly rare thing, with I believe only a few hundred at most being in the UK. Had you told me it was less, I would have believed you. This is not actually the first time that I've driven an XKRS because in a different life, when I was thinking about embarking on something called a YouTube career, I drove an XKRS. I remembered them very well because I saw them when they were new and loved them. I went to the new market races in about 2012, 2013, and there was one there. I was blown away by it. I also remember that the show car in Newmarket had a sticker on it that said 95,000 pounds but the one I was looking at just three or four years later said 45. I did go and drive the car. It was in the stunning French racing blue that I'm a big fan of, but I didn't buy it for a couple of reasons. First off, this infotainment even then felt very much out of date. Secondly, I wasn't so confident then as a driver that I could really pilot and enjoy this car to the full. Even today, it's beautiful out there. It's 20 odd degrees and this thing is struggling to get its power down. The car does have a limited slip differential, but it's one of these tricksy ones that can vary how much lock it has, depending on what the computer tells it to do. And unfortunately, it never really worked that well. It's a very unpredictable thing. You're never quite sure exactly what it's gonna do. I'm certain that the main issue with today's car is the fact it has 10 year old Pirellis on. If you compare this with the XKR75, which had a fresh set of Michelin Pilot Sport 4s on, the difference is stark. Not only did the Michelin shod car grip better in the wet than this does in the dry, but the ride quality was also dramatically better. Having now driven many of these cars, the changes made to the 75 and RS certainly aid the dynamics, the sharpness and the feedback, but good tyres are also crucial to getting the most out of these big cats and taming them ever so slightly. However, let's sweep all of that aside. What's the XKRS actually like? Is it any good? And is it today, in 2022, when it's still £45,000, worth your money? <laughs> to be entirely honest, I love this car. Yes, it is stiff, but only in the context of other Jags. I'm currently driving it in dynamic mode, which does a number of things, sharpens up the throttle, might add a little bit of weight to the steering, changes the traction control setting, doesn't really help, just changes it, and leaves the exhaust valves open more of the time. On downshifts, it produces a crack that is incredible. That 
that engine is more or less worth the price of emission on its own. The brakes here are competent, probably the weakest element of the package, but still better than in previous XKs. Take the car out of dynamic mode, the suspension backs off just a little bit and it becomes rather jag-like. The gearbox I'm driving in manual mode because it's very good in manual mode. You've also got drive and sport settings for it and they work very well as you would imagine them to. Put it in drive now. The turning is very good. The front end of the car grips quite nicely. It's no flyweight this, still well over 1.7 tonnes, but it hides its mass very well. The steering feel is also pretty decent. It's a little bit too light for my liking, as is the case with many Jags, but if you listen for it, there is feel and feedback coming through the rack. It's hydraulic, not electric. Visibility is okay. It is a big, long, swoopy coupe after all, so there are areas of the car that are a little tricky to see out of, but generally speaking, for this kind of stuff, it's not so bad. If you want to make more discreet progress, leave the car out of dynamic. I wish there was a switch just for the exhaust, because sometimes, even I think, it is a bit too much. What am I saying, even I think? Actually, I'm a right old miser when it comes to loud exhausts, but this one does sound glorious. Placing the car is not impossible. You can see more of that bonnet than you might expect. A 997 Generation 911, even a Carrera 2S, is definitely going to beat this as a sports car, but this still should be viewed as a GT. The F-Type is more sports car orientated, but this not so much. When you view it through that lens, you realize this is a very, very capable car. Is it much improved over the XKR75? The gearbox, I would say, is better. The engine is so close, I don't really want to call it, and the chassis, pretty similar. This, I think, could be a touch stiffer, a touch more agile, but really, it will be set up and tires that could make the difference between the two. The seats, I really like. The interior is fabulous, and I actually love the exterior color, too. This car has been brought to me by James, whose mother Liz actually owns it. She bought it in 2013 when it was nearly new because she'd taken him to a lesson and was sat waiting for him to return next to a Jaguar dealer. Saw this and went, hmm, that's a bit of me. It has been in her ownership, used and enjoyed on a daily basis ever since. It's in fabulous condition. The interior does feel like a really special place. Even the headlining is leather. The seats, very comfortable, quite supportive too. They look nice, not as racy as say a full bucket, but I think they suit this kind of car. Having the swathes of red leather on the black also lifts it a bit and makes it feel just a cut above your regular Jag. The infotainment was always laughably out of date, but at least you can fix it with Jag Droid, so you can plug your phone in and have some modern functionality. Would I have this over the XKR75? Now that is the tricky question. I think I might, but only because I am a card-carrying tart, and I cannot be doing with a grey Jag. But if you're not worried about that, or you're actively put off by the looks of this, the 75 is still a wonderful proposition, and perhaps the Jag that gets the balance the most right. I have been desperate to get one of these on the channel for so long, and I am very glad to say that now it seems to be perhaps a better car than it ever was. And if you want one, you yeah, probably should get one soon, because prices only seem to be going one way. I also happen to think this is one of the few cars that really deserves to be worth a little bit more. I mentioned earlier that Jaguar are a company in a near constant identity crisis. A number of years ago, they decided to push heavily with both diesel and the Chinese market, and neither of those, I think, paid off in the way Jag hoped. Let's be honest here, if Jag wasn't nailed to the side of Land Rover, it probably would have died a death years ago. They have recently announced their intention to turn the company into one producing exclusively electric vehicles, which I'm sure they said they were gonna do a number of years ago, then changed their mind, said they were gonna produce an all-electric XJ, had nearly finished 
producing said all-electric XJ and then canned that, which would have been an excellent way to bring the company into the future, especially as they're now going all-electric, but they didn't want an all-electric XJ at the head of it. Now, that probably didn't make any sense because it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know what you're doing, what you're thinking, Jag, and for that reason, amongst others, i.e. it's a brilliant car, this is likely to be seen as a future classic. Particularly if you're not a huge fan of the F-Type, this is probably one of the last performance Jags you'll want to get your hands on. And it's worth doing so. A huge thank you to James and Liz for bringing their car out. To you for watching, as ever, don't forget to like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.